This is Ed Driscoll for PJMedia.com, and we're talking today with Aaron Clary, the self-described Captain Capitalism, who blogs and podcasts at CaptainCapitalism.blogspot.com, is the author of the 2013 blogosphere hit, Enjoy the Decline, and is the author of the new book, Bachelor Pad Economics. And Aaron, thanks for stopping by today. Thanks for having me, Ed. Aaron, most financial and self-help books have rather grandiose titles, dating back to Napoleon Hill's classic 1937 book, Think and Grow Rich. In contrast, Bachelor Pad Economics, at least going by its title, sounds like a more modest approach to finances. So what constitutes the economics of the bachelor pad? Uh, well, there's several uh, you know, uh, traits or qualities, I guess, or, or strategies. But I, I, one of the most, um, probably the most important one or the underlying one of them is uh, minimalism. And uh, the, the reason I started focusing on minimalism is not just because I was brought up poor and I, it, it was by force. But as time goes on, especially in the Western uh, civilization, we, we rely on stock markets uh, and, and, and capital gains and stock valuation for our retirement. Um, you have a bubble with uh, primarily baby boomer retirement uh, dollars driving up the, the, the price of stocks. And so uh, when they withdraw their money, I, I foresee at least a stagnation in stock prices in terms of, of real rates of return. And... Uh, that is going to put the onus or put the focus on personal budgeting and cost control and spending uh, as little as possible. So there's that financial aspect. And then the other aspect or minimalism that, that kind of underlines the book is that uh, material wealth really doesn't matter. I'm the biggest capitalist there ever was, but, but truthfully, the only thing that really matters, the true source of happiness is other humans. And the great thing about humans is they're free. Um, you know, so your family, your friends, your loved ones, those people willingly hang out with you and are going to provide a higher rate of return, a higher quality of life than a Ferrari or anything like that. So uh, Bachelor Pad Economics, is, you know, there's certain other aspects like the education and career and all this other stuff, but it is focusing on maximizing your amount of time on this planet to spend on you and leisure and not be slaving away 80 hours at the office and just so you can afford that McMansion in the suburbs or the, the you know, BMW uh, uh, SUV. Aaron, your Twitter profile describes you as, quote, the only motorcycling, fossil hunting, tornado chasing, book writing, ballroom dancing economist in the world, unquote. Could you talk about your background in economics and how you made the jump to new media? Uh, it was all accidental, uh, truthfully. I majored in finance at the University of Minnesota and uh, ended up becoming a credit analyst. And kind of uh, to the buildup of the housing bubble, um, it wasn't accounting or financial statements that was where the threat was coming from. The threat was coming through valuations, through uh, loan to values, through economics. And I had minored in economics. I always loved economics. It was my original major, but it just wasn't practical in terms of employment. Uh, however, as the housing bubble grew larger and larger and larger, I was forced more and more into analyzing the economy and housing market than I was people's financial statements or companies' of, uh, income statements. And uh, that kind of sent me on another trajectory where that work then, the next bank I worked at had me more in a role uh, as an economist. And then I also wrote a book about the housing bubble. And that, along with just banking being so horrendously corrupt and inept, uh, I couldn't tolerate it anymore. And slowly but surely, uh, my writing career ended up taking off, especially with the advent of the Internet and Amazon. And, uh, and yeah, it just, and when I, when it came down to the choice, like, okay, let me see, do I want to blog and write from my laptop on a beach or at the uh, Yellowstone National Park, or while I'm riding a motorcycle up to Alaska, do I want to do that? Or do I want to sit in this cubicle analyzing financial statements? So I cut the string about, oh, two years ago and, uh, have not looked back. The timing of your previous book, Enjoy the Decline, was excellent, coming as it did in early 2013. Shortly after Americans voted for another four years of Mr. Decline himself, Barack Obama. Let's break the title down to its two halves, particularly since you expand upon these themes in the new book, Bachelor Pad Economics. Could you start by explaining how America wound up in its current period of decline? Uh, yeah, we're, we're basically, uh, the quality and caliber of the people has declined. Um, you look at People today, you know, a perfect example, it's a meme going around the Internet. There's a picture of a World War II vet who was 26 and then a picture of Pajama Boy who was 26. And, and that, that basically sums it up right there. The, the country is only going to be as good as its people. The government, you're going to get the government you deserve. 
uh, and that's that's where the decline comes in. So that, that's the primary thing. And then the symptoms that you see are government debt, government deficits, uh, spending per pupil. Glenn Reynolds' new book, he's got some great charts in there showing that spending per pupil adjusted for inflation has gone up fourfold, but the performance has stagnated. All these things show uh, they're just it's just the Roman Empire version 2.0. Uh, and that's that's uh, where the, the, the decline aspect comes in. And then there's the first half of your book's title. If America is in a protracted, possibly irreparable period of decline, what are some ways to enjoy it? Well, the first thing is to accept reality um, and enjoy the decline. It doesn't parallel perfectly the, the five or six stages of Greece, but it's, it's the same process. You know, the United States, everyone grew up at the United States. Uh, uh, we love it. Uh, and, and we were told what to believe, Ronald Reagan, rah, 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 all that other stuff. But the, the, the key to enjoying it is to first accept reality, because if you live in denial... Every decision you base or, or make based in that denial is not going to be effective. So we first have to realize that uh, the United States is a, at least in a, a declining state or at minimum a stagnation. Uh, the prospects do not look uh, good for the future. I, I don't see us turning around. And you have to also admit that no matter what, the United States is not special. Uh, every empire collapses. Everyone throughout the history of the world does. So uh, we, you got to say, okay, I'm here and alive now. Uh, I don't want to le- believe in, in flowers and puppies and unicorns. Uh, so given that the United States is in decline, what decisions can I make that will still make the best of a bad situation? Well, you mentioned Glenn Reynolds' books on the higher education bubble. To build on the themes of those books, do you recommend spending large amounts of cash for higher education and advanced degrees majoring in arcane subjects? to get ahead in 21st century America? Not, not arcane subjects. Uh, if you want to become a surgeon, maybe, and even with Obamacare, that's, that's doubtful. But um, it, it really d- does depend. I had another book called Worthless uh, that was basically the young person's indispensable guide to choosing the right major. And it really does depend. You, it, it's very simple. Ask people what they want to buy, what they want to purchase, or what they're going to purchase, and then go major in something that builds that. That's how simple it is. Uh, so if you want to major in English in an English-speaking country, that's pretty stupid. You want to major in feelings and emotion, or you want to major in your skin color where, uh, or your ethnicity, you know, the Chicano American studies, that's stupid. Uh, but if you want to major in chemical engineering, electrical engineering, stuff like that, yes, it's worth spending the money, but get your bang for your buck. It's not worth, I don't know how, well, I know how, but I, I, I don't know how people can think dropping six figures on a master's or uh, an advanced degree in the liberal arts is, is, is wise or sane. What role does real estate play in bachelor pad economics? It, it, it's kind of a, a, a love-hate relationship, and it really depends on the individual. If you're a family man, um, yeah, you probably want to get a house uh, if you're going to raise a family. If, if, and then some people, they're also really good. They can do the corporate thing. I can't do the corporate thing. I just can't. I'm too independent-minded, and I got two sphere, or have hemispheres of a brain. Uh, but, uh, so for those people who can reliably be employed for 20 years, 30 years, the, the life of a mortgage, sure, go ahead and get housing. But at the same time, uh, realize that local governments are just as socialist or trending socialist as the federal and state governments. So you, you're buying the right to pay property taxes. And in some towns, especially like Detroit, Minneapolis, Chicago, the property taxes get so high that you're paying more on, on property taxes than you are principal or amortization on, on your, on your, uh, mortgage. Uh, but outside of the family man living in a, a pretty conservative suburbs or you know rural area, I really don't like real estate uh, in terms of an investment because, especially as a bachelor, especially if you're going to be doing the minimalist route, a house is just pointless. It, it, especially with telecommuting and everything nowadays, you're anchored to that property. I think Peter Schiff and I share some of the same views on this. You got to maintain the home. It just isn't worth it. It is so much easier and so much freeing of your life to rent and have a landlord deal with the maintenance issues and everything else uh, uh, than becoming a homeowner. So it really does depend on the individual and and what you want to achieve in life. Given the titles of both of your recent books, what is the relationship between having kids and having financial freedom? Uh, A negative correlation. (laughs) Okay. Not not necessarily. Financial freedom is one thing, but happiness is a completely different ball of wax. Um, Kids are humans, and they're probably the most, the single most source of happiness and joy uh, loving good parents will ever have, and, and they can also be the worst experience ever if you're not prepared to raise them. Um, 
But definitely in terms of money, absolutely, children are the number one cause of poverty. Uh, that That's just a fact. And you have a kid, well, your income per capita has immediately dropped by half. Uh, so you that, that you definitely want to make sure, you know, I'm not saying don't have kids. I know people that have kids and they're wonderful kids. And, and, and boy, I... You know, I kind of say, God, maybe I should admit. And then, then I see the crying, screaming kids that are throwing rocks through windows, and they're my windows. And I'm like, get that kid out of here before I get caught, you know, called to child services. And uh, so, it, again, it does depend on the individual and what they want in life. Aaron, I believe that both of your recent books rather infamously reference the, quote, Smith & Wesson retirement plan, unquote. Most of us would rather not, to quote Pete Townsend, fire the pistol at the wrong end of the race. While recommending much about bachelor pad economics, in a post at PJ Media earlier this month, Dr. Helen Smith, who helped champion your books, took strong offense at your suggestion. Could you elaborate on your reasoning? Well, the reasoning is is economic, and it is secular. I, I won't deny uh, that. So people who are religious uh, or even traditional, um, they, uh, they obviously would be against that. And, and I take no umbrage and no offense to it. Uh, but from a uh, an economics, a purely economic point of view, um, and, and even a humanitarian point of view, there's sometimes where you're you're, you're terminally ill. Um, there's there's you know you're about you know uh, pick your pick your poison, cancer, uh, a brain tumor, whatever, uh, and you're not coming back. You are going to die, and the remaining two weeks, three months, whatever your life is going to be absolutely in pain and misery. Uh, I think it's it's wise or, or and, and and humane or what's the word I'm looking for compassionate uh, to you know somehow kill yourself not necessarily with a with a Smith and a Smith and Wesson but some kind of euthanasia and it not only you know puts you out of your misery uh, but it also saves it a ton of money I mean you, you I forget what the statistics are but a plurality of of your health expenses are incurred in the last six months of life. Uh, so you want to talk about, you know, saving your, your family, the grief of having you, watching you just decay and uh, whatever, mentally, physically, uh, what have you, be in pain. Not to mention save the, the finances for a future generation. Uh, it, it's, it's, you know, it's not for everybody. I'm not saying you have to do it. I, I'm just saying it is an option. Well, barring that approach, how would you recommend planning for retirement in today's economy? Oh, it, it really depends. I would get some money outside of the United States. Um, so it cannot be confiscated via via the um, like Argentina or Cyprus. Uh, I would definitely contribute to a 401k and an IRA, even though I'm not a big fan of retirement plans. And especially if, like, say, your 401k or 403b, you have a match, absolutely, because that's free money. Um, but then maybe have some exposure in property, not necessarily something that you'd live in, but through real estate investment trust, because real estate is a pretty good hedge against inflation, um, and it does go with the population as, as, as long as your population is growing, at least there's some intrinsic value there. Uh, I also recommend having gold and silver, um, not necessarily for investment purposes, but more inflation insurance uh, reasons. Uh, but then like in terms of other asset groups, there really isn't a lot of growth. I mean, the everyone, it's not just the, the United States baby boomers that are retiring, but boomers of, of all the Western nations where most of the capital has been. And that these retirement dollars have, driven up stock valuation everywhere. Um, this is why your dividend yield is like a paltry 2%. This is why, uh, well, for other reasons, central bank, that your, your, uh, your, your government bonds or your, int- your uh, uh, savings account pays less than 1%. Uh, so there's really not, a, I don't see a lot of hope. I don't see a lot of up and coming um, uh, economies. I mean, maybe Singapore, Malaysia, Hong Kong for like a safety bet. But that'd be more investing like a like a blue chip stock. You're, you're really not going to have a, a ton of uh, you know twenty percent annual gains over the course of ten years. And speaking of bachelor pad related questions, I have to ask: How did the photos of various lovely young women reading your books appear on your website? The wait, which wait the the, the ladies? Which one are you, are you talking? Um, There's a photo that's currently on the right-hand sidebar of your weblog of a very attractive young woman reading. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I have, uh, well, I, I have friends uh, of the female persuasion. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and let's say ballroom dancing and knowing how to salsa uh, helps. And watching Victor Borga, Walter Matthau movies, and Cary Grant movies, and maybe, maybe plagiarizing some of their sayings and words uh, and, and building up some charm uh, might have a say in that. But uh, yeah, there a lot, most of them are friends. Uh, all of them are friends, and uh, we'll we'll leave it at that. They're they are friends. <laughs>
And your blog makes several references to the manosphere. I know what the blogosphere is, but what is the manosphere? Well, the manosphere is kind of, it, I'm, not, I'm not trying to tout it, uh, but it, it is just the truth. It's this up-and-coming backlash to feminism. I guess it's the best way to put it. Um, you've had essentially two and a half generations of men brought up without dads. Um, or even if the dad was present, they've been emasculated. Uh, and it, it's, uh, there's, I'm, I'm trying to be succinct with my description. Basically, boys like girls, men like women. It's probably the most important thing in our lives, especially when we're younger. And the amount of lies and baloney we were fed about how to approach women, the nature of the sexes, blah, 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 is wrong. It was all, all couched in feminism or he heavily influenced by 60s, 70s feminism. The manosphere is basically the older brother or the uh, father you never had that says, all right, look, Junior, here's the deal. No, girls don't like nice, sweet men. They don't like it when you write them poems, and they don't like it when you give them flowers. They like it when you hit the gym, lift weights, show up on your motorcycle, and then don't call them back for a week. That may not be pretty, may not be nice, may be completely politically incorrect, but it's truth. It's reality. And so you have a lot of guys who are now turning to this older brother kind of manosphere where you compare notes, say, hey, did this work? No, did that work? No, did this work? Yeah, that worked. So I got an entire chapter about girls, and it's heavily uh, influenced by the manosphere, especially in, in terms of sexual market value. So we apply some economics there to describe uh, uh, the dynamic and the relationship between men and women, and, and specifically and practically how to use that to your advantage to uh, woo the young ladies. And Aaron, last question. Your books are predicated on this nation being permanently hosed. Is that a reasonable assumption, or is there any hope for America yet? Oh, there's always hope. Um, I, I see some glimmers of hope. Uh, like, for example, and this gets, uh, again, to the manosphere, and, and kind of, I'm, I, you could say I'm crass and direct and blunt and very politically incorrect. Um, uh, a disproportionate amount of my readership and uh, viewership for my blog and my, my podcast, or, I'm sorry, my, my YouTube channel, are minorities, especially black males and his, uh, Hispanic males. And they, the reason there's hope is because these guys are sick and tired. They've been sick and tired of being lied to their entire lives by primarily leftist politicians. And here's a guy who's like, hey, you know what? I don't care about your feelings. I don't care about your race. Here's how it is. This is, what, this is why you're poor. Here's a practical way to get out of it. And I have a huge loyal, or not, not a huge following, but a very loyal following uh, um, from minorities. So when I see uh, a lot of the uh, Hispanic and, and, and black males uh, becoming even more conservative, more libertarian than I am, even uh, that kind of gives me hope. But in, in general, that that's a a niche of the of the blogosphere that uh, that I'm in, uh, where I see some hope. But the my books are predicated on the U.S. collapsing because if the U.S. didn't collapse and it boomed, well, that's not hard to adapt to. You just enjoy the you j enjoy the incline. Uh, but what does take some doing is learning how to maximize your utility, enjoy your life to the, to, to the limit uh, in, a, in a poor uh, environment. This is Ed Driscoll, and we've been talking today with Aaron Clary of CaptainCapitalism.blogspot.com and the author of the new book, Bachelor Pad Economics. And Aaron, thanks for stopping by PJMedia.com today. Thank you very much, Ed. <laughs>